gospel from beginning to end. For the next two months, we're going to be looking at this idea of the gospel traced throughout the scriptures and everything that the gospel touches. And here's where I want to begin today. Here's what I want to begin today. If the gospel is the message, the message of good news, then the question becomes, can we trust the messenger? If the gospel is the message and the Bible is the messenger, can we trust our Bible? This is an incredibly important question, especially in our time of a little hot. This is an incredibly uh, important question in our time because the reality is many people, even within the church, do not fully trust the Bible. For many, the Bible is nothing more than a bunch of stories filled with contradictions, outdated, irrelevant, it's anti-scientific and unreliable. And even for those who do trust it, they're not entirely sure why they trust it. And if challenged, would have no idea how to defend the trustworthy and reliability of the scriptures. Never forget a conversation that I had with a woman in a hospital she had attended our church several times and really liked our church and she had terminal cancer so i was there visiting she was asking me if i would do her funeral but she said if you do my funeral i don't want you to preach about jesus i said well why and she said because i'm not sure i believe it she's gone to church her whole life i said why why don't you trust the gospel the good news of jesus because she says I'm not sure I trust the book. I remember a conversation that I overheard in Saxby's. Um, I was sitting there, I had my Bible open, I was doing some Bible study for a Sunday afternoon or for a, a Sunday morning service. I had my ear pods or AirPods in. And I was listening to some music and that music was done. I didn't turn on anything new. Some ladies came in, they sat down next to me, they saw my Bible and they began having a conversation that they didn't know I could hear. And they started talking about my Bible and they started talking about religion. And so don't judge me, I eavesdropped. <laughs> and to find out that one of these ladies was a choir director in the church that she had grown up in, but she said to the women who were present, I don't believe in the resurrection and I don't believe a word in the Bible. But a choir director in her church. Countless times when I've been sharing Jesus with other people, people look at me and they look with this puzzled look in their eye like, how can you possibly believe this book? It's so old and it's so unreliable and, and, and just, they look at you like incredulously, like how can you possibly buy this? You see, for so many people, the primary barrier to believing the message, the good news of Jesus Christ is that they don't trust the messenger. If you can't trust the messenger, it's hard to trust the message. And I even wonder in a church of our size, how many of us still, maybe we've, we've trusted or we want to believe or we want to buy into the story of Jesus, but you are stuck on the thing of how reliable is the Bible. And so today what I wanna do as we begin this gospel series is if we're gonna trust the message of the gospel, I want to elevate our, our, our confidence in the word of God so that you can know when you walk away today, the Bible in your hand, you can trust. Father, I pray God that today, you would build our confidence and our trust in your word. And for those who are here today, who are um, interested to hear what you have to say about this topic, I pray God that you would speak to them. And for those of us who maybe already believe this, God, I pray that this would help us to learn how to defend our faith in a skeptical world. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name, all God's people said. Amen. Well, if you're joining me in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, I'm gonna begin here, and I'm gonna begin with the Bible's assertion about itself, 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to back up and we're going to defend that assertion. Not that the Bible needs a defense. It's a line. You don't, you don't defend a line. Just let it out of its cage. And that's what we're going to try to do today is we're going to let the line out of its cage. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says this, All Scripture is breathed out by God. Let's look at that again. All. How much? What? Scripture is breathed out by God. And it's profitable for teaching and for reproof and correction and for training in righteousness that the man or obviously woman of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. Let's begin here with some context. Right here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible asserts itself as a supernatural book. When I say supernatural, what I mean is it is not a natural book. It is not a book written by men. Though men, though ink was pressed to parchment by human hands, make no mistake about it, the Bible asserts that it is divinely inspired. Again, it says in chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God. If you have the old King James translation, it might say all scripture is inspired uh, by God. This is where we get the doctrine of divine inspiration. And you might be wondering, what does the, the, the doctrine of divine inspiration mean? Well, let me hear, uh, let me say what it doesn't mean. Number one, it doesn't mean that human writers were inspired to write. So this, what it doesn't mean is that some guys throughout history um, got this emotional creative spark that moved them to write something about God and about history. In other words, um, sometimes when you get inspired to clean your room, inspired to do some homework, you know what I'm talking about, inspired to take out the garbage, inspired to do something that you don't normally want to do, that is not what we're talking about. Nor do we mean this idea that somehow God breathed into a person some general vague idea of what he wanted them to write about. Hey, why don't you write some prophecy or some poetry or some love songs or some whatever, some prayers. He didn't breathe into them some ideas, okay? So it's not that God inspired the individual, and it's not that readers are inspired when they read. In other words, uh, like the Bible is chicken soup for the soul, right? And so when you read the Bible, you get inspired by it to be the best you, you can be, and whatever that means. Like it's chicken soup for the soul. In fact, I was on a plane just last week coming back from Barbados having a conversation with a guy. His, his dad was a hippie. His uh, mom was an ex-Catholic. And so they had, or, or I'm sorry, an ex-Jehovah Witness. And so they had this interesting combination of hippie and Jehovah Witness. And so I asked him, where does that leave you with the Bible? And he said, basically, the Bible, I believe, just exists to inspire people to be better people. That's not what inspiration means. What inspiration means Inspiration has nothing to do with the human writers, and it has nothing to do with the readers. It has everything to do with the actual words on the page. Does that make sense? Look again at what it says. Chapter 3, verse 16 says, all scripture, that is graphe, that's the Greek word graphe for the written words. All of the written words are breathed out by God. As you are listening to my voice right now, uh, Air is escaping my lungs, going over my vocal cords, being manipulated by my tongue right now so that as you hear me, you are hearing the words that are literally coming out of my chest, breathed out by Matt Townsend. And what he is saying here in the text is the very words that are written on the page are the words that God has spoken himself through his voice. These are the very words words of God. Now we understand that these words are filtered through eyewitnesses of historical events. They are filtered through the personality, the knowledge, the background, the vocab, the style of the particular writers, okay? But they are not stenographers. They are not secretaries. They wrote through their own personality, their own experience, their own eyewitness stories. But here's the key. When we say that the Bible is inspired, here's what we mean. 
What God wanted to say got said exactly as God wanted it said. When we say inspiration, that's what we mean. What God wanted to say got said as exactly as God wanted it said. Now, let's be clear in this. What we mean in inspiration is also this, that, the, that God inspired the original autographs, okay? And every copy afterwards, some people say, well, every copy afterwards is inspired, 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 inspired. No, God inspired the original autographs, which were written thousands of years ago. But here's what I want you to know. The copies that have been made throughout the centuries are reliable, trustworthy, so that the Bible you have in your hand does not contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. And there's a seriously big difference in those two things. So, though men put ink to parchment, the author is unquestionably divine. You can trust the messenger. Why? Because God says so. Now, you might be saying, well, that's a pretty big assertion that God would make that all of Scripture from beginning to end is inspired by him and that the very words themselves are the exact words that God wanted us to have. Well, let's move on to our second point here. I want you to see five proofs of the reliability of the messenger, five proofs of the reliability of Scripture. And like I said, This is not an expository sermon. This is an apologetic sermon. We're not apologizing for the Bible. We are defending it. And so the first thing that I want you to see as a proof of the reliability of the divinely inspired word of God is, first of all, it's accuracy. And when I say accuracy, I don't just mean that the Bible is doctrinally and theologically accurate, though it is. I don't just mean it's morally and ethically accurate. I also mean that it is historically accurate. And the reason why, the best way to get historical accuracy is how? What is the best way to get historical accuracy in things that you have not seen? Who do you go to? You go to the eyewitnesses, the people that actually saw the events occur. That's how you find good history. How do we know that Washington crossed the Delaware River? People saw it. How do we know that Lincoln gave the uh, Gettysburg Address? People saw it. How do we know that the Cubs won the World Series in 1908? Somebody saw it. That's how we know history is that we had eyewitnesses. How do we know that Moses parted the Red Sea because thousands of people saw it? How do we know that Joshua and his army saw the walls of Jericho fall because thousands of people saw it? How do we know that we serve a resurrected Savior because hundreds upon hundreds of people saw it? It wasn't just the 11 guys in a room making up a story. Hundreds of people out in the middle of, of public places saw a risen Savior. And that's why in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Peter, when speaking of His seeing uh, Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said in 2 Peter 1.16, for we do not follow cleverly devised myths. In other words, there's a bunch of myths out there about religion, about Jesus, about all sorts of different gods. It's all made up. I mean, if you want to look at a made up religion, look at Islam. It's a guy who sat in a cave and received a bunch of divine revelation. He probably was having seizures and he wrote it all down in a cave and then came out and birthed a whole new religion called Islam. That's how we got Islam. These are eyewitness accounts to historic events that multitudes of people saw. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And here's the amazing thing about the scriptures is that you can test the historical accuracy of the scriptures. If you go back, just look at Luke. Luke in the book of Acts you will find that Luke was writing an account to Theophilus, a man who, I'm not sure if he believed in Jesus or not at the time, but Luke wanted to give an account of everything that Jesus had done and all the impact that it had. And he was not an eyewitness, but he had done the research of talking to eyewitnesses so to present to Theophilus an amazing account of everything that Jesus had done. Now you would think that in Luke's In all of Luke's research, talking to all of these different people, because he covers 32 countries, 54 cities, nine islands, if there was some inaccuracy somewhere, somebody would be able to figure it out. 
Well, interestingly enough, archaeologists have actually tried to do that. They've tried to figure out maybe, maybe there's something messed up with Luke's account of all of this. Because Luke was a doctor who was very meticulous. And the archaeologists that have done excruciating research on this have come up with this conclusion that his Gospels, the Gospel of Luke and the, and, and the Book of Acts, are written with unparalleled geographic historic accuracy. You can go to these places, the, uh, the Aeropagus where Paul preached, the theater in Athens where there was the riot, the Pool of Siloam where the man was healed, uh, Herod's temple where Jesus went. You can go to all of these places because it's accurate, it's reliable. For years and years and years, college professors would scoff at Christians and they would say, how can you possibly believe in this book? I mean, just look at the Hittites. The Hittites are a people who are mentioned 50 times in the Bible, and yet there's no reference to the Hittites outside of Scripture anywhere. No extra biblical writings anywhere reference the Hittites. Well, 30 years ago, we started finding hundreds of references of extra biblical writings that reference the Hittites as living for 1,200 years in the Middle East just as the Bible's been saying for thousands of years. If you look at King David, for years people were saying, how can you believe the Bible? You know, this King David, who is one of the central figures of Israel's history, we can't find any evidence of him in extra-biblical resources. Well, back in 2005, I got to go to all the sites where they've excavated inscriptions of King David's name written everywhere. The Bible's unparalleled in its accuracy, historically. But think about this, and maybe this is a little anecdotal, but I think this is amazing. That 11 men, 11 disciples, went to their grave and died for this story they believed passionately about Jesus. That he not only died on the cross, but he rose again. And here's the fascinating thing about it. You realize for that story, they had to hold on to that story for decades, and they all died for it, everybody except John. They, they tried to kill John, they couldn't kill him. They boiled him in water, he wouldn't die. So they exile him out to Patmos, and then he ends up writing Revelation, how it's all gonna end. But do you realize these guys got sawn in half, tortured, boiled, crucified upside down? And yet they held on to the story till the end. Why? Because they made it up in some room somewhere just so that they could get people to believe in something that they were trying to do? No, not at all, because it was true. Compare that to Watergate, you had six men who couldn't even keep their story straight for two weeks, and they had unparalleled incentive to lie. Couldn't do it. The Bible is accurate historically in every other way, reliable. Trust the messenger, trust the message. Secondly, it's accurate. Secondly, it's prophecies. Now, what is fascinating about prophecy, if you look throughout literature historically, it's actually very rare to find predictive prophecy in the writings of most religious writings. Um, if you look into the writings, there's no predictive prophecy in Buddha. There's no predictive prophecy in Confucius. If you look into, into the Quran, there's about one uh, predictive prophecy, and it's incredibly general. And the reality is that most prophecies that are made are usually vague, they're usually general, they're usually nonspecific, and oftentimes they end up wrong. You look into the Old Testament, you will find over 2,000 prophecies given in the Old Testament. How many? How many of them are prescribed to Jesus Christ? Nearly 300. Now here's just a few examples. Daniel, and do we have that? Uh, Daniel gave us the exact time of Christ's appearing. Peter, or I'm sorry, let me back up here. Uh, Daniel gave the exact time of Christ appearing. Micah predicted where the Savior, the Messiah, would be born in Bethlehem. Zechariah predicted that Jesus, the Messiah, would enter Jerusalem on a donkey uh, and be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Look at the specificity of these prophecies. Isaiah predicted that he would be born of a virgin. And people say, well, that's borrowed from other places. Very different. Do your research on that. Don't fall for that lie that we've borrowed from other myths and pagan religions about that one. That is Baloney, just say baloney. Can we say baloney in church? We just said it. We're moving on. 
Isaiah predicted that he was born of the virgin, that he would die next to criminals, and that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Psalm chapter 72 predicted that shepherds and kings would come and worship him and bring him presents of gold. And in Psalm chapter 22, David predicted that Jesus Christ would be crucified. And here's what's incredible about that. He predicted the crucifixion and describes it in agonizing detail hundreds of years before crucifixion was invented. The Persians invented crucifixion. We know crucifixion like hands and feet, uh, nails and the whole nine yards. But cr- uh, Persians, when they invented it, they basically just took a guy, put him up on a pole and let him die. That's how crucifixion began, and it, then it evolved by the Romans. And so by the time it got to Rome, David had no idea. All predicted with 100% accuracy. And that's why 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, Peter writes again, No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. Guys aren't sitting in rooms coming up with great ideas as to how they want to promote their their agenda. It didn't come about by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And that is, here's the point, the level of uh, precision and specificity and predictive prophecies is unparalleled. The Bible has no equal. Some mathematicians many years ago, uh, I believe it was either Josh McDowell or Chuck Swindoll mentioned this. Uh, Many years ago, some mathematicians tried to figure out what was the mathematical likelihood of eight prophecies of Jesus Christ being fulfilled. Just eight, not 300, not 60. How many? Eight. The mathematical likelihood would be one to 10 to the 17th power. So one in 100,000 trillion was the likelihood of eight of these prophecies being fulfilled. And that would be like, and I've used this analogy before, if you were to cover the the great nation of Texas with silver dollars up to your knees, about two feet, and then you were to take one of those silver dollars and put a red dot on it and throw it out into the middle of Texas, then blindfold a guy, send him out and say, you got one shot to guess which of those coins is covered in that red dot. The mathematical likelihood that you get it on the first time, Ryan, is the mathematical likelihood of eight prophecies in Jesus being completely and perfectly fulfilled, and we've got 300. Prophecy, number three, durability. The Bible is reliable, it is prophetic, it is durable. Men come, men go. Generations vanish, the Bible marches on triumphantly. Century after century, the Bible continues to endure. First Peter chapter 1, verse 25 says this, The word of the Lord endures for a long time, forever. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. If we put this in comparison to other historical writings, Say, for instance, Homer. Homer uh, was the uh, blind poet of Greece. He uh, had many writings, and he has the most uh, manuscripts that we have been able to preserve up until this day. And there was a saying about Homer's writings, and it went like this, Homer must be handled with care. And what they meant is all of the remaining writings that we had of of Homer were dwindling and falling apart. And so you had to be really careful with them when you were dealing with them because we don't have very uh, very many of of Homer's writings left. And in fact, I got a chart up here that I got from Brandon Capuano. This is really helpful. If you look at Caesar... And when he wrote, and his earliest copies that we have, AD 900, Plato, AD 900, Aristotle, 1100. And what we're talking about is the earliest manuscripts that we have of their writings, how far back they go. If we look at Homer, we actually have writings of his. He, he, was, he was writing in 800 uh, BC, uh, but we have his earliest copies to 400 BC. So 500 years later, we have 643 of his manuscripts. Now, here's the deal. No one goes around questioning Homer. No one goes around questioning Caesar. No one sits around wondering, oh, can we really rely on Aristotle? I'm not sure. We only got seven of his manuscripts. Is that right? 49. (laughs) 
No one does that. But we do it with the Bible all the time. And yet here's the thing about how many manuscripts we've got from the Bible. The Bible, 40 AD, 125 AD, a 25-year gap between the events and the writings, and we've got 25,000 different kinds of copies. It's pretty durable. And here's the amazing thing. Century after century, tyrants have tried to snuff out the Bible constantly. After Alexander the Great in the 400s, Antiochus Epiphanes, called the Madman, launched a bloody assault against the Hebrews in an attempt to destroy all of the Old Testament scriptures. Josephus writes about this. He said that any time the Madman would find copies of scripture, they would be set to fire and the owner would miserably perish. And yet, in all of this suffering for owning copies of the Word of God, people's passion and appetite and desire for the scriptures only increased all the more. Flash forward to the 1500s when Tyndale was making copies of the Bible and copying them into English so that people could have a copy of God's word in their own hand. He was condemned as a heretic, strangled and burned at the stake for making copies of the Bible. And yet, it birthed a movement that caused the English Bible in America to just explode. Flash forward to 1700s when Thomas Paine wrote his book called The Age of Reason, which was an outright attack. This was during the time when the modernism and postmodernism was just beginning to give birth. The Enlightenment over France was beginning to take hold over there and it was moving into the United States. And so all of these authors were coming up and, and giving reason as to why we can't trust the Bible, why the Bible is ridiculous, and why the Bible can't, and on and on and on. And one of these guys was Thomas Paine. He wrote the book, The Age of Reason, which had incredible influence in its day. But today, if you go to his hometown in Stockton, California, where approximately 250,000 people live, there is one copy in the library. It's been checked out 16 times over the past 10 years. One of my favorite anecdotes is about Voltaire. If you don't know who Voltaire is, don't worry about it. He was a French infidel. You don't want to know. But here's what's important. He predicted that Christianity would die within 100 years of his lifetime. That when he died, the only place you'd ever be able to find a Bible would be in a museum. <laughs> you ready? This is awesome. Ironically, Within 50 years of his death in 1778, the Geneva Bible Society bought his home and began using Voltaire's own printing press to print Bibles. <laughs> the Bible is the most read, best-selling, most widely translated book in history. It endures not because it's a book, because it's a supernatural book. It is God's book. Uh, fourth, the reliability of the scriptures. Now, some of us might be saying at this point, okay, okay, okay. All right, maybe, maybe, maybe the original writings of the scriptures thousands of years ago were reliable and those were the word of God. But man, we've had so much whispered down the lane throughout the years that can we really rely on the written word of God now? I mean, you, did you ever play telephone or whisper down? I called it telephone when I was young, but it's whispered down the lane. You know how it goes, right? So I start over here and I whisper something. I'm not gonna do it, Tim, because we, we have a, a great friendship with a professional distance, right? <laughs> I don't know. But if I were to whisper something to you and then you whisper it to Lori and then you whisper it down the lane, it goes. And we know how this works. The fun of the game is I share with you my original message, and by the time it gets down to the end of the row, typically the message has what? Change. And so we would say, well, okay, maybe the original writings, yeah, they were of God, but this has been translated so many times throughout, uh, throughout history, we can't possibly trust it. Well, just to give you some historic context on transcribing, which is what we call the copying of the scriptures, 
there was a group of people called the scribes. I want you to write that down. And you can write that down in your Bible. There was a group of people called the scribes, and they devoted their entire lives to the copying of the biblical text. And when I say copying the biblical text, like, I don't mean like you're copying something down for school, and you like see a couple of words like, duh, 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 okay, and then you write it over here. What I mean is they copied like Xerox copiers. Precision. And here were some of the rules. They had tremendous rules. They had things that they had to wear on their head and on their body. If they got a letter wrong, they had to throw it out and they had to wash themselves ceremonially. If they came to particular words, they had to wash themselves. They had all of these rules that they had to follow. But the way that they copied was letter by letter, not word by word. Why? Why not word by word? You ever been texting with somebody and in your stupid phone autocorrects to something that's pretty embarrassing? that's why you don't do it word by word because if you get a word wrong, then it gets the sentence wrong, then the sentence wrong, get the paragraph wrong, the paragraph wrong gets the book wrong. Do bo- you see what I'm saying? It was letter by letter to protect wrong words be- from becoming wrong paragraphs, wrong messages. And here are some of the rules. They were only allowed five mer- mistakes per book. Now, they couldn't have a mistaken word And they couldn't really even have a mistaken letter, but maybe something in the letter was mistaken. And here's a picture of two completely different letters in the Hebrew writings. Do you see how closely they resemble each other? Do you see why accuracy was of the highest importance? Because when they were translating, if you get just a little too much ink on that one side right there, all of a sudden a letter looks like a different letter. They were unbelievably meticulous in their care of the scriptures. Now, can you imagine you get five mistakes in a letter? Can you imagine trying to transpose Isaiah? So you're on chapter 65, and you've just spent two years of your life trying to transcribe this letter, and you've got one mistake left in your arsenal, and you are freaking out because if you get one more mistake, you've got to scrap all that work that you've just spent two years of your life on and start over. Just to prove my point further, say, go on. Okay. For the longest time, for the longest time, we didn't have a lot of the Old Testament writings that dated back earlier than 900 AD. So, um, can, do we got that chart up there? There we go. So, for a long time, and a lot of people use this against uh, people who trusted in the Bible, they would say, well, we don't have any of the manuscripts that date back to anything earlier than 900 AD. Um, we don't have any manuscripts that go further back than that. And, and, and the Old Testament was written, and this is just Old Testament writings. The Old Testament was completed in 400 BC. That's a 1300 year gap. So obviously during that time, whisper down the lane must have taken root into this Well, lo and behold, and this was a legitimate argument for a lot of people who wanted to throw skepticism and doubt on the Bible. 1,300 years, that's a lot of time. Can I get an amen? Okay. So in 1947, there was a little shepherd boy in a little city called Qumran, and he was out having some fun with his sheep, and he came along this cave right here. Do I got some pictures of it? You can't see it very well, but there's, there's a cave right there. He took a pebble, he threw it up into the cave, and he heard some jars shatter. He walked up into the cave, and what he found were all of these scrolls, and he didn't know what they were. And so he turned them over, to, or he didn't gather them. He got the authorities. They came, they collected them, and they gathered them. And what they found out was that these were actually scrolls that dated all the way back to 400, 600 BC, all the way back. Now, here's the question that everybody had. I wonder what the Bible from 900 AD is going to look like compared to the Bible from 400 BC. And here's what they found. And I'm just going to read this to you because this is, this is un- unbelievable. And you can go down to Washington, D.C., didn't you guys, uh, Scott and Courtney? You just saw this the other, uh, I mean, it, it's, you can see it for yourself. Here's what they said. And Isaiah chapter 53, just for instance, I mean, must have changed, right? Over 1,300 years, it must have changed, right? Must have changed, right? I mean, we can't possibly believe this book that's thousands of years old. It has to have changed. Here's what they said. In Isaiah 53 alone, of the 166 words in Isaiah 53, there are only 17 letters in question. 17. Okay? 
10 of the letters are simply a matter of spelling. Four more letters are minor stylistic changes, such as conjunctions. The remaining three letters comprise one word, the word light, which is added in verse 11 and does not change the meaning in any way. Thus, after a thousand years of whisper down the lane, only one word, three letters, are even in debate. And this word does not significantly change the meaning of the passage at all. And Jesus said himself, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one tittle will pass away until the law, from the law until all of it is accomplished. Can you trust the Bible in your hand? Yes, you can. And finally, consistency. Let me say this quickly. I love how one pastor put it like this. The Bible is incredibly consistent. If I were to hand out 50 pieces of paper right now, if I were to hand out 50 pieces of paper, and I were to say to you, Lori, go ahead and tear this piece of paper up in any way you want to, and then the other 49 of you were to do the exact same thing. What is the statistical likelihood that all of us, after having independently ripped up these pieces of paper, would be able to take those pieces, put it together, and it would form the United States of America? What's the likelihood that that would happen? Zero. And yet, I want you to consider the Bible. This is not one book. This is 66 books. History, law, poetry, letters, prophecy, written by 40 authors who were shepherds, political leaders, kings, tax collectors, religious leaders, prophets, spanning 1,600 years. And you would think that this would be the absolute, a chaotic mess. And yet, throughout all of scriptures, all the scriptures from beginning to end, there is one theme. There is one theme. Jesus said in Luke chapter 24, verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. In in John chapter 5, verse 39, speaking to to the Pharisees who were really into the rules, he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. If you just obey all the rules of the scriptures, you're going to have eternal life. And there are people here that still believe that, that if you obey all of this, you will somehow gain eternal life. And Jesus says, it's got nothing to do with obeying the rules. You can't obey all the rules. It's impossible. And so Jesus says, and it is they, the scriptures, that bear witness about me. The singular theme of all of Scripture, there's only one theme. Actually, there's multiple themes, but there's one primary theme. And just think about this. We can't even get four people who witness a traffic accident to agree on the details. And the Bible has a singular theme, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to do next week, in fact, is we're going to unpack the singular theme of redemption as traced throughout all of Scripture. So next week, if you're wanting to know what is the text that we're going to be in, it's right here. It's the Bible. And you're like, how long are we going to be preaching? 40 minutes, don't worry. Just like normal. But one author put it like this, how do you get 40 different people from different walks of life separated by 1,600 years to write about the two things that nobody ever wants to talk about, religion and politics to agree? How do you do that? That's because it's written by one author, and his name is God. So you can trust your Bible. Now, maybe you're here this morning and say, okay, I believe I can trust my Bible, but so what? What does that mean? A couple of things that I want you to take away with you this morning, it's this, number one, The Bible is reliable. Your Bible is reliable, okay? Get a good translation of the Bible. There are bad ones, but good translations of the Bible are reliable. ESV, King James, New King James, NIV. Don't get the TNIV. You can read the message for your devotions, but don't get the Generation X Bible. I just found out there was a Generation X Bible. It's like, hey, bro, Jesus came and gave out some, some, some bread. Uh, 
John 17, verses 1 and 17 says this. Jesus spoke, Father, your word is truth. Jesus believed the scriptures were reliable. Titus chapter 1, verse 2, God says about himself, God cannot lie. You can trust what this book says. So here's what I commend to you. Don't depend on what I say about it. Don't depend on my daily bread. Don't depend on some other authors writing about the scriptures. You get into the scriptures for yourself and you read it and you say, well, Pastor Matt, I can't understand the Bible. It's hard to understand. I know. It's very difficult. Everybody has to start somewhere. I remember the first time my pastor back when I was 15 said, open to the book of Job. And I'm like, I can't find Job. I see Job. I was completely ignorant. I had to start somewhere. Just start reading and don't give up because there's life in these pages. Secondly, this book is sturdy. This book is sturdy. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. And Jesus talks about building our life on sand and building our life on the rock. And Jesus, the bottom line of that parable is this. When you build your life upon this book, you are building your life on solid rock. You build your life on this book. You conform your life to the commandments of Scripture and the teachings of Jesus Christ and all that is written herein, and you seek to know it and understand it and apply it to your life. You are building your life on solid rock. If you don't, if you're a Christian, you come to church, but the Bible has nothing to do with your life outside of these walls. You are building your life on sand, sinking sand. Number three, it's authoritative. If God wrote a book and God made you, then who's in charge? If God wrote a book and God made you, who's in charge? Yeah. John chapter 14, verse six says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one, no one comes to the Father but through me. People say that's pretty exclusive, Matt. I know. That's why I'm heartbroken at the times in my life where I have failed to share this message with more people. You can trust the one. Jesus, God didn't have to give us a way back to God. Praise God that he did. And his name is Jesus Christ. Number four, mission. Number four, mission. John chapter 20, verse 21 says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. You and I have a mission to be a light in this world, whether you're a mom, working in a dental office, driving a truck, sitting in a board meeting, buying a car in somebody's office, whatever it is, you are called to be salt and light in this world, no matter where you are. And here's the thing, church. It's one thing, it's great for us to come and sit and, and fill our minds with the knowledge of God's word, but if we have no intention of being an army, kicking down the gates of hell and setting captives free? Can I be so bold as to say we're borderline wasting our time? We are called to be an army and we are called to set prisoners free, prisoners who are shackled by sin and shame and darkness and brokenness and they need the message of Jesus that can set them free. Who the son has freed, he is free indeed. And I have that mission, and so do you. And number five, the word of God is a hammer. The word of God is a hammer. It's not chicken soup for your soul. It's not a good suggestion book. It is a hammer. John, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29 says, is not my word like fire and like a hammer that pulverizes the, water, the rock. The word of God pulverizes unbelief, skepticism, hardness of heart. You wanna know what changed this sinful, broken 14-year-old kid that was ready to take his own life and actually tried and was unconscious for three days and was a brutal, mean, a corrupt, broken, twisted, wicked kid? It was the word of God. The word of God is what softened my heart, made me tender, made me receptive. It was the repetitive, uh, intentional, repeated time in this book that took this heart of rock and is molding it into something beautiful. Next week, we're gonna look at the big picture of scripture. We're gonna see how it all fits together. But today, I want you to walk away with this. The Bible that you hold in your hand is the word of God. It is a supernatural book that will transform your life 
if you let it. Trust it. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for who you are. And Father, we ask and pray that you would help us to trust this book with our very lives. Like those men of old, those women of old who gave their lives in defense of this book. Like the disciples who gave their lives in defense of the message. Father, help us to trust the message so that we can trust, help us to trust the messenger so that we can trust the message. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.